Welcome to episode 179 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to, once again, retired agent Scott Duffy who served in the FBI for 22 years. For the majority of his career, he was assigned to the Wilmington Resident Agency out of the Baltimore Division, where he worked violent crime matters and was later promoted to a supervisory special agent position. In this episode, Scott reviews his years-long investigation of what started out as a rumor that Thomas Gibbonson had whispered to high school classmates while attending a senior prom. He and a friend claimed that their new spiderweb tattoos were symbols of their allegiance to white supremacist skinhead dogma, and that their tattoos were quote-unquote earned by them shooting a black man. This nearly two-decade-old racially motivated homicide was tenaciously pursued by Scott Duffy and his partner, ATF Special Agent Terrence Mortimer. With the assistance of the Philadelphia Police Department, Thomas Gibbonson was successfully convicted of conspiracy to commit murder, ethnic intimidation, and firearms violations. Scott Duffy served as the coordinator for the FBI's Delaware Violent Crimes Task Force from 1999 to 2011. Scott currently serves as the Associate Director of the Criminal Justice Institute for Wilmington University. I want to remind you that we spoke to Scott Duffy before in episode 157, where he reviewed a case about a Russian national who robbed a bank and killed his mother. It was a wild and crazy case from Delaware. However, today's episode I would describe as haunting It will make you angry and sad that an innocent man was murdered because two skinheads were looking for a black man to kill in Philly that night. Before we get to the interview, if you're listening within the week or so that this episode comes out and you live in the Philadelphia area, I want you to know that FBI Retired Case File Review, that's me, will be one of the featured podcasts at the Women's Podcast Festival on Saturday, August 24th at noon. I'll be there with stickers and buttons and bookmarks, so I hope you can come out. I would love to meet you in person. There's more information on my website about the festival, which is being held in the Fishtown section of Philly. Also, I'll be back in the recording studio tomorrow for two more days of narrating the audiobook for FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives. If you haven't gotten a copy of the book yet, members of my reader team can get the FBI reality checklist and take a peek at the 20 cliches I cover in the book. If you're not a member of my reader team, then you can always sign up at my website, jerrywilliams.com, or if you're listening to this on a podcast app, just look for the link in the description of this episode. If you've already picked up your copy of FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, thank you. And special thanks for those of you who have posted a review on Amazon. Wow, five stars. I want this book to become the book to read if you're interested in learning more about the FBI. FBI Myths and Misconceptions is available wherever books are sold as well as the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series. Thank you for the support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Scott Duffy. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good, Jerry. How are you doing? Great to be back on your show. I want to let you know that your last episode was very well received. I mean, I I had lots of downloads and people were fascinated by the fact that you conducted this murder investigation that started as a bank robbery case. And in a way, this particular case that we're going to talk about 
you also came to it in a totally different angle. Yeah, very true, Jerry. So it almost seems like a pattern of my cases in the FBI. Yes, it does. Where it starts out one way and then ends up in a totally different arena. I'm always reaching out to people, letting them know that, you know, I'm always looking for cases. And I come back to people saying, hey, do you have another case for me? And when you told me about this case, I didn't remember it. And I should, because again, it happened during the time that I was actually the spokesperson for the Philadelphia division. So when I went back and Googled it and, you know, pulled some of the articles, I was just like, wow, where do you want to start? If I could, Jerry, I'd like to start with creating a picture for the audience, okay. um, which is, so my partner throughout this whole case was an ATF agent out of Baltimore, and his name was Special Agent Terrence Mortimer. So Terry and I became good friends during the course of this case, and one of the, I want to say, pictures that we tried to picture in our head as we went through this case was imagine yourself as a senior at your prom. Imagine wherever that may be, a hotel or some sort of venue where the tables are set up, typically eight or 10. In this case, it was a table of 10. And so you have five couples at a table and picture yourself 17, 18 years old, enjoying the end years of your four years of high school and then thinking of whatever your future holds for you, whether it be a career, college, whatever it may be, it, it's, it's everything coming to an end for your, your secondary education and now beginning your higher education or going right into employment. So it's a, just imagine those years. And I'm kind of living that right now through my son as he begins his senior year in high school and just kind of looking back at a whole array of things, whether it be the immaturity of and the maturities, the experiences gained and, and the wonderment of looking towards the future. And the reason why I say that is because you'll see, as I talk about towards the end of this case, this is where a lot of our, if, if you want to call it evidence or collaboration, bringing together witnesses who had never imagined after sitting at a prom table together, which was located at the DuPont Hotel, where 18 years later, they would be confronted by an ATF agent and an FBI agent asking them what they remember and the conversations they might have had that night, the night of their prom. So early 2003 is really where this begins. I am an FBI agent assigned to the Wilmington, Delaware office in the violent crime section, if you will, where anything with regards to violent crime would probably fall on my desk as Wilmington, Delaware is a resident agency out of the Baltimore office. There are field offices throughout the country, and then there are resident agencies or satellite offices that surround those field offices. And so Baltimore was my field office. Wilmington, Delaware was considered the resident agency or satellite office, which covered the three counties in Delaware. So as I'm sitting at my desk, I get a call to see if there's any interest to, to kind of um, start, if you will, an investigation into, at this point, what is a letter, a story by an individual saying, I believe my boyfriend who's getting ready to get out of uh, prison is looking to or possibly have the detective who put him there um, a threat of bodily injury. So, of course, the FBI is interested in the threat made towards other law enforcement, in particular federal law enforcement. The reason why we had been asked is because this particular detective, um, who was phenomenal throughout the case, very instrumental, not only in his gun case that led to the initial arrest of the main subject of this case, Tom Guybison. So Detective Doug Iardella was a Wilmington police detective, very well known, undercover work, um, his many years in, in Wilmington. So he had just become a well-known name. 
for his ability to seek the truth and justice in any case that he pursued. Doug Iardella was attached to the Wilmington office of the ATF as a task force officer. Doug Iardella had started a case years before uh, we got involved in this. Unrelated to this, his subject was Tom Guyverson. Detective Iardella was working a gun case and ultimately led to the conviction and incarceration of Tom Guyverson. Fast forward a little bit, I get a call regarding the exit strategy where Mr. Guyverson is going to be, has served his time, will be coming back into Delaware to reside and begin his supervised release probation. One of the allegations were that there was a threat or an alleged threat against the life of Detective Iardella for that very case against Guyverson and others. So Terry Mortimer, who is an ATF agent out of the Baltimore office, is given the case for Baltimore. They wanted to give the investigation to an agent outside of Wilmington for obvious reasons, as Wilmington, not only in the FBI, but ATF, is a small office. So pulling up resources and whatnot, Agent Mortimer and myself meet and begin from what I could describe as one of the greatest investigations that I was able to be a part of. Lots of obstacles, pitfalls, things that I never imagined had come across and ultimately to, to what I believe was a successful conclusion. We start our interview with Detective Iredella and his wife at the time is Diane Iredella and at the time was a special agent for the ATF. Well, that was a coincidence. Yes. As I said, Wilmington is small. So Detective Iredella married to Diane Iredella, again, an ATF agent that I had gotten to know over the years in Wilmington. And as a side note, a great sketch artist is one of her specialties throughout the ATF in her ability to do sketches and had been very successful in bringing to conclusion cases of all varieties on the federal and state level. So we interview the Iredellas. We gather what we believe is enough information, determine, hey, what, what do we have here? Is it somebody who's simply voicing some gripes as, as I've had in my past, as I'm sure you have, Jerry, where we put people in jail? That's, that's our job in seeking justice. For the most part, people understand, okay, it's a, it's a cat and mouse game and uh, you got caught and you got to pay the piper. And then hopefully, as we realize, oftentimes not where prison is not a rehabilitation, but simply time off the streets. So Terry and myself had a list of, of witnesses, not witnesses, but a list of leads to go through to determine if, if, in fact, we could bring a federal case of a threat against the life of a federal officer. As I said, that at this point, Detective Iredella was a task force officer, sworn task force officer for the ATF. So at that point, he is deemed a special federal officer. Well, let me ask you a question, because I just want to be clear, because you had briefly mentioned this. Are you being called in just so that there is another agency and it doesn't give the appearance of a conflict? Yes. In addition to the FBI does have venue jurisdiction for investigating threats against any federal officer, whether it be another federal agency, a court officer. So we have jurisdiction to investigate crimes or threats against federal officers. And at this point, Detective Iredella was a sworn federal officer in his position as a task force officer for the ATF. So yes, it's uh, both, not only did we have jurisdiction to investigate threats against federal officers, but also at the same time to give that appearance of uh, uh, having another agency outside the ATF 
to partner up with and and fully investigate these uh, these allegations. So that took yeah. us probably th- two to two and a half years, painstakingly going through any type of letters that might have been written to or by Tom to others that might have any indication that uh, there there were overt threats as we need, and not just somebody who's looking to fulfill a gripe or somebody who's simply getting off their chest, hey, I didn't like somebody, I didn't like the officer that arrested me, I didn't like the agent that arrested me, I'm getting ready to get out, I'm, I'm upset. But um, if it goes no further than free speech and you have a right to your opinions and thoughts where it doesn't rise to the, to the level of a crime, that's where, that's where we were involved to figure out if indeed there was an active threat, a credible threat, and a prosecutable threat against the, the life of Detective Ardella. So we spent some, the better part of two, two and a half years trying to determine if, in fact, these, um, these allegations would rise to that level. And at the end of the day, we were not able to come up with any particular evidence in order to bring a case against him and prosecute. So the investigation was complete. No charges were to be brought forth against Time Gibson or anybody else with regards to the initial reason why the FBI got involved into threats against a federal officer. So during those two and a half years, we, Terry and I started to uncover rumors at this point where some of the people that we had spoken to, I'm talking about neighbors, current neighbors, past neighbors of Guyverson or anybody else that might have come across him, somebody that might have had information, anything whatsoever to help shed light on our investigation. While we had been conducting our investigation into threats against a federal officer, it was at that point we started to uncover, I'm going to call it a theme, for lack of a better word, where, hey, you guys shouldn't be looking at Mr. Guyberson for threats against a federal officer. You should be looking at him and named another individual, an individual that we had already known was a close friend of Tom's uh, throughout high school. And I don't know how much further back, but at least in the latter part of years of high school and then post high school, where this individual had, as well as Guy Bisson, these thoughts of uh, racism and that Tom Guy Bisson and who I'm going to, even though he's been named in papers, I've always tried to um, to give that extra level of, of um, anonymity towards anyone that helps us in any case, but CP. So CP and Tom Guyberson were known, at least what we were being told in our early investigation, were part of a informal group of skinheads in Delaware during their high school years. And skinheads being a loosely formed Delaware chapter where you have a particular hate towards a particular group. And in this case, two white individuals who had expressed ideas of racism, the fact that they did not like African-American individuals. Remember, this is 2005, 2006, thereabouts, going back to the high school years of Guy Bisson and CP. That takes us back into the late 80s. So as you could see, we were trying to investigate threats against the federal officer investigation for anything that was current, relevant, and prosecutable, and and we couldn't find anything. And then we were left with not one, but many individuals saying they have heard, they have heard, they have heard rumor, whether it be on the streets or passing circles, that Tom Guyberson and CP were involved in the murder of an African-American individual. And that was that. Without talking to Tom, without talking to CP, we did not know where this murder had taken place. We did not know the exact time that this murder had taken place, but we had documented it. And I can tell you, Jerry, that 
of all the things that I have heard, have documented, have filed away, knowing that ah, this uh, this is not going to be able to go anywhere. I'm not going to be able to find any evidence. We're not going to be able to corroborate anything. It's simply going to die in a vine. But there was something that Terry and I had always believed was this sounds believable, but it's rumor on the streets. And how many people would you say were telling you this rumor? So let me take you back to that table of 10 at the senior prom right. in 1989. This is where Terry and I believe that the investigation had to go. So we had a table of 10. You had Tom Gibson and his date, CP and his date. So that's four people. Then you had another six individuals that we had to first and foremost identify and then determine where they are at 15 years later in their lives, wherever they may be in the country. And then to ask them the question, hi, my name is Agent Duffy. This is Agent Mortimer of the ATF and FBI. We would like to ask you about any conversations that you might have had on the night of your prom at the Hotel DuPont in 1989. If you had asked me, hey, Scott, what were you talking about, thinking about, or anything like that on the night of my prom, I don't think I could come up with any particular concrete fact of what the topic of discussion was at my table. But there was just something strong in the air that kept telling Terry and I, don't stop, keep going forward with this. The truth is out there, and you're going to find it. And why did you think that it went all the way back until when he was in high school or graduating from high school? Because early on in our investigation and talking with people who had associated with Guy Bisson and CP and and others in his his small circle of friends back then kept saying, the story came out that Guy Bisson and CP had received this web tattoo on the elbows of their arm, and they believed that it was shown to this table, this prom table, and then, of course, to others uh, at the prom, where the tattoos were so fresh that if the allegations of a homicide, and not just a homicide, but a racially motivated homicide, was fresh at the time of this prom, and then, of course, the, the receiving of these tattoos, that started to give us an idea that the homicide had to have occurred shortly before the prom in May of 1989. So now we started to have an idea of a time, a time stamp, something we could go on, but we still don't have a location. It could have been Delaware, it could have been anywhere. So we started to do our old fashioned database checks. Hey, what kind of unsolved homicides? And then we're not even sure if it's a homicide. It could have been somebody that was, was hurt, was maimed and did not uh, succumb to their injuries. And so it would be an assault. So these were, we, but we started with unsolved homicides in the state of Delaware that could possibly fit in the time frame, knowing that the time frame would be prior to May of 1989. What are we looking at? Are we looking at six months prior to, a year prior to, weeks, days? So these were some of the obstacles that we, we had to go through. And as you could see, our database searching of any unsolved homicides that could remotely fit, just were not, were not coming to the surface. So like any other frustrated investigation, you're left with what you have. You have a story, a story that took place at a table on prom night on uh, May 1989. Here it is 2005, 2006. So Terry and I decided let's go find these other couples and let's go and have a talk with them. That took us as far as Ohio and then throughout different uh, parts of Philadelphia and Delaware, where we realized these individuals had not gone too far from their roots in Delaware. And I can tell you each and every one of those meetings were in person, face to face. And even as far as Ohio to go and knock on somebody's door and say, hi, this is Agent Duffy and Agent Mortimer with the FBI and ATF. We would like to talk to you about something you may or may not remember, but possibly have heard, and we're going to take you back to your prom table, 1989. After sharing a lighthearted laugh or joke, as uh, 
we were ordinarily accustomed with. Is this, is this a joke? No, this is not a joke. And we would like to have a few moments of your time. Without wanting to give up any information and trying to see if, in fact, we could jog their memories, we simply said, hey, we're here conducting an investigation. And we want to know if there's anything that you remember hearing. And maybe you thought was a joke back then, but it was something that you would remember. And we mentioned the names of the other individuals at their table and said, in reference to Tom Guybison and his friend CP, I can tell you each and every one of the individuals we had met with, and none of the others had known that we were coming to talk to them. It wasn't like, okay, we started on night one with couple number one, and then went to go speak with couple number two, and they had said, oh, our friends had told us you were coming and had this crazy notion that something had happened, so let me tell you what I believe. No, it was a cold interview, and each time... I remember looking into the eyes of everyone we had spoken to who are now well into their 30s, different professional statuses in life, some husbands, fathers, mothers, and they looked at us, their jaws dropped, and said exactly what we had been hearing. You want to know about the spiderweb tattoo. You want to know if, in fact, Guybison and CP had shot somebody. Wow. And so in wanting to keep uh, our cool, he said, yes, that's exactly what we're, why we're here. And what do you remember? Is there anything you could tell us that we can go and corroborate? So the stories were similar in the fact that they re- each recall Gibson and CP pulling up their tuxedo shirts and presenting these, what they described as fresh to the point that there was still bloody remnants of the tattoo. And they were proud to show that it was a web tattoo with the skull in, in, in web uh, weaved into this tattoo, and that that was indicative that they, in fact, had shot and killed an African-American male. What did you do? Did you take measures to make sure that you hit everyone cold, or was it just a coincidence that none of them reached out to each other? So, again, think about 16, 17 years later, I can tell you if, if an agent had approached my door and said, Scott, we want to talk to you about your prom night. Do you remember attending it? Yes. Do you remember who was there with you? I don't think I could even tell you who I was there with other than my, my prom date. And so it was very similar to these. These individuals had lost touch with each other. They were not friends in the way of being lifelong friends maintaining a regular communication. Also, this was kind of still early in social media. So it, if, if somebody wasn't posting something on something to say, hey, two agents just uh, approached me and asked me about this crazy story of what we might have heard on our prom night, this was still in our favor where none of the individuals knew that we were, were coming to talk to them to the very end where the last individuals we were able to identify and find had not known that we had been talking to anybody else seated at their table. And and trying to find these individuals, in fact, or identify and find them was, was, a, uh, was a task at hand, which included going to back to the high school and going back to the Hotel DuPont and, and trying to find any, any pictures whatsoever of these individuals. And then to verify, in fact, that they, in fact, sat at a table with Guybison and CP. So, so at the conclusion of our interviews, having no physical evidence other than a very similar story to go on, the fact that Guybison and CP were so proud of these web tattoos that there was no doubt in any one of the others sitting at the table that these tattoos were fresh and remembered had seen blood on their white shirts that each and every one of them feared that there might be some truth to the story, but not one of them, and remember, they're 17, thereabouts years old, took it serious enough where they felt the need to tell another adult, much less law enforcement. So that story remained with them, and it did not go anywhere else, other than remained a part of their memories. Now we're approaching them 15 some odd years later, 
hey, I believed it back then, but perhaps I, I just didn't feel it strong enough to tell anybody else. But they had all confirmed the fact that this story had gone around on that prom table. So that still gets us nowhere closer to where we were prior to starting down this, this venture. Right, because you didn't have a person, an African-American, who had been shot in Delaware around that period of time. Right. We had no victim. We had no name. We had nothing other than the stories of kids, and that's what they were, senior prom kids. Looking at a tattoo of two individuals who were sporting these proud, racially motivated tattoos. And and a story went with it. And those stories remained in their heads for the better part of 15 years. But Terry and I believed that we were onto something and we just could not let it go. And uh, we had talked quite, quite often in our travels. How far do we take this? Where can we take this? Is there another agency to get involved in order to come up with information? So Terry and I had gone back and forth, back and forth and realizing It's now 16, 17 years later. What do we do? We're going to have to approach one of the two individuals, Guybison or CP. There is no other way to figure out how to get closer to finding out if this story had any truth or not. So we decided between our collective experiences that CP was the individual we're going to first approach. And why did you decide him and not Guybison? So the story throughout that we had learned from talking to people at the table and then some other associates, friends, or people that had known Guybison and CP, we had asked their opinion. If this was true, who would you say that we should go speak to first? If this was a true story, should it be Guybison we go talk to? Should we go talk to CP? In other words, we're looking for, in law enforcement, who would be the weaker link. And like anything else, if you're looking to figure out who pulled the trigger, so to speak, it's the person who pulled the trigger that is the last person I would like to talk to. We took a, a, a stab in the dark that CP would be the individual we would approach first. So CP was no longer in Delaware, and it took our travels up uh, northern New England where we had finally found CP residing in what I would call the hills of, it it was mountainous, Middlebury, Vermont. It was shortly after 11 o'clock at night, after it seemed at least a eight to nine hour drive, that Terry and I were so pumped that we couldn't just wait for morning. We had to go and do a knock and talk. That's how pumped we were. We, we, it was fresh in our mind. We had been on the road and we figured, let's do it now. So we, um, we stopped at the local barrack of the Vermont State Police, told them what we were there for. And they were able to verify, yes, this is the residence of CP. And what are you looking for? And they said, we want to do a knock and talk tonight. And it's just going to be a knock and talk. We just want to get an idea of if we're on the right track or not. And, uh, no warrants, no nothing, nothing other than going to talk to an individual, just like we had talked to the other individuals at that senior prom night. It was dark, and I remember the uh, the house sit up high on a mountainous street. And as soon as we got out of our cars and we had the Vermont State Police with us there, that these floodlights, I just remember is almost like being at a baseball game, at a uh, baseball park. Floodlights just came on, obviously motion sensor which led us up, which now made us feel like, hey, what's going on? We feel like we're not getting the the upper hand of surprise. And I remember before we could get to the door that uh, an individual, a man and a woman came out. There was some very large dogs. They came out on the porch. We I- identified ourselves and they couldn't have been more hospitable and welcoming. Come on up, Wh- whatever it is, what can we get you? As soon as we got into the door, we didn't want to waste any time. It was late. We apologized for knocking on the door at a late hour. And we took CP aside and said, CP, after identifying ourselves, we said, we want to talk to you. And we don't want to do it here. We don't want to do it in front 
of what we later learned was, was his fiance. And we said, we would like to talk to you about a story. That's what it is as, as of now. And we would like to get your side of things. Can we set up a meet? We set up a meet in the late morning hours of very next day at the barrack for the Vermont State Police that had graciously set us up for an interview room. And without ever asking a question why, without ever asking anything other than tell me where to be, CP had obliged us and said, I will be there. And that was that. Spending no more than a few minutes in the house, we had then left, got into our hotel room, and immediately started preparing for what we knew would be the interview of our lives, coming to somebody seeking the truth of whether or not this story that we had heard over and over and over again by different people at different times telling the same thing that Tom Guybeson and CP had obtained spiderweb tattoos after telling a story that they received those tattoos to memorialize the shooting death of an African-American person. Why were you so confident that he was going to show up? Jerry, I wasn't confident at all that he was going to show up. As a matter of fact, I believe, as Terry and I could tell from our experiences, that we were going to be stood up. That if anything, we would receive a phone call saying, hey, I've, I've thought about it and there's nothing to gain from it. And so I'm politely decline your offer to be interviewed. Or I thought about it and guys, I'd like to help you but I'm going to have to find an attorney before I come and speak with you at the barracks of the Vermont State Police. So that's, Terry and I were fully expecting not to have that interview, at least not at the time that we agreed upon. I can tell you there wasn't much sleep I got that night. Terry and I arrived very early at the, the barrack where we had agreed to meet with CP. We saw him pulling up in the parking lot alone and uh, very well put together, dressed, and and approached the lobby of the state police barrack and said, I'm CP and I'm here for a scheduled interview. It was at that point that we realized this is really going to go forward. And so we strategized as to who would take the lead and where we would start. And we decided we would start just like we did, which, which with each of the other attendees at that senior prom. Thank you for coming. This is Agent Mortimer and Agent Duffy. We are simply following up on a story where something was said, a tattoo was obtained, and so be it. So we were really at this point treating it as a as a senior prom discussion where I think I was fully expecting CP to say, absolutely, that story and uh, what a funny, funny story. And that's all it was, was a story. I look back at it 17 years later and just realize how foolish that was as a 17-year-old to scare my prom date and, and the other sitting at the table. But uh, what do you know? That's, that's what I was expecting, Jerry. But after we gave our couple of minute spiel, not going too much into it, but of, uh, of with him, of what we had already heard, we danced around a little bit saying, hey, we're conducting an investigation. And like anything else, your name and Top Gompison's name popped up. And the story goes like this, that it was a senior prom. Two individuals had received these spiderweb tattoos. And at least at the time that these two individuals who received these spiderweb tattoos received them after stating that they had been involved in a racially motivated crime, didn't get into homicide yet, and that the group that they belonged to, this uh, Delaware Skinheads group, now made them proud members that they can sport this this uh, tattoo, and that they shared the story and the tattoo with other individuals at their senior prom table. I can tell you that CP listened intently and then told us, I never heard of that story. I have no clue what you're talking about. And I can tell you I was at the table. I was at a senior prom with my date and, of course, with Tom Guybeson and others. But that story does not ring any bells with me. 
Okay, so you had set this up so beautifully that I just knew you were going to, you were going to say that he immediately spilled the beans. So with him <laughs> with him making this statement, I mean, does your heart sink? I mean, you must have been just so disappointed. Extremely disappointed, but I think as Terry and I had been living this case and thinking of every imaginable angle of where we could go wrong, go right, the frustrations of are we are we simply following a couple of seniors in high school that made something up from the very beginning and literally tying up our time that we've invested into a case that finally come down to picking one of two individuals to speak to first to see if this case is actually going to go further with the possibility of somebody who might actually have been at a true crime scene, hoping on our end that it was the lesser of two at the crime scene. In other words, the one who did not pull the trigger. And this was simply conjecture on our part at this point, from what we believed in talking to, to others surrounding this group, that for him to deny the fact what six other seven other individuals have already told us, having heard from the mouths of CP and Gybeson of this story and the tattoo, that when he denied it, Jerry, as much as my heart sank that I was hoping he would just spill the beans, it also confirmed to me as an interviewer that we were definitely onto something. Because all he had to do, like anybody else, was say, of course, I remember my prom. And now that you say about this story, I'm embarrassed to say I'm an adult now. I'm, I'm living in Vermont. I, I have a family. I realized the stupidity of my youthful experiences or the groups that I have joined or wanted to join. I put that all behind me, right? I mean, like any other childish prank or childish story or childish thing we were involved in that we might have regret now as an adult. I fully expected him to say, of course, I heard the story. And yes, I might have embellished this or that, but it was just a story. And I can tell you there's no truth to it. But when he denied the fact that it was even a story told, that's when the hairs on the back of my head and my neck went up. So Terry and I took a break. We stepped out of the room. And we said, he can't even accept the fact that the story was put out there. Like any other of the individuals we talked to, and they all remembered the story so vividly that why is he not coming off the story? Right, because they're remembering it from 15, 16 years ago, just as the person who heard the story. He's the person who was part of telling the story, and he's saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I see what you're saying. In a sense... His denial is almost a confirmation. It definitely was fuel for Terry and I that this was not just a story. We had justice to seek. So we said, let's go back in and put a little bit of heat into this. Tell them a little bit more of what we know. And this is going to be a case that's going to be fully investigated. The person that comes into the door first is going to be the person that's going to receive some sort of benefit. Of course, not being able to offer any promises and any investigator can't, we've realized we wanted to see if we can at least get him to come off the story. And uh, so we, we both agreed, let's see if in fact he still has a spider tattoo. If I remember correctly, he was wearing a flannel shirt, long sleeve shirt. So we both went in and we said, all right, CP, we just want to ask you, if the story is false, does that mean the spider web tattoo is also false? Or do you have that tattoo? I could see in his eyes as his eyes rose up that the tattoo existed. And he didn't want to show us. But we'd asked him, hey, would you roll up your sleeves and show us this tattoo? And sure enough, he raised his sleeves. and We could see the tattoo sported on his elbow. And so we just made it part of the story. CP, do you understand where we're coming from? We've just been chasing a story, a story from senior high, prom night. And you see how you denied the whole thing, but yet you have a tattoo. So would you at least tell us when you got that tattoo? 
he was a little bit hesitant, hemming and hauling, and then said, yeah, I guess I remember getting the tattoo shortly before the prom. We're like, yeah, that's, see how easy that was? I mean, it's a story that's been told, a story that's been heard by other members or other people sitting at the senior prom table. And you see, the tattoo exists. So for the first time, I'm able to say part of that story is true. I now see evidence of a spiderweb tattoo with the skull in it. I think many of us are wondering, as you're conducting this investigation, did you also look into what was happening with this, I guess you call it the skinhead community at the time? And were you able to establish if it was indeed true that as a skinhead, if you were to kill an African American, that you would be entitled to have a spiderweb tattoo? Yes. So part of our investigation was as Terry and I had not been involved, at least to what I believe any degree of a hate crime investigation prior to this. And so like anything else, when you initiate an investigation and you're not quite understanding what you need to establish, yes, we went and spoke with professionals, both at the Anti-Defamation League and other experts, anything that we could could research to say, hey, is the spiderweb tattoo, in fact, part of somebody who is affiliated with a skinhead or other uh, white supremacy group? Is it possible that the spiderweb tattoo could actually indicate that a crime had been committed, a crime worthy of a group, whatever that crime may be, and thereby the the tattoo is is a patch. It's a it's a code of honor. It's it's um it's hey you've you've reached the next level. So yes, we were able to show that. Though I know over the years tattoos take on different meanings. I can tell you at this time in the late eighties, especially that uh, and from what they believe that getting a spider web tattoo was in fact indicative of the movement at the time, that is being a white supremacist. And the skull depicted inside the web tattoo was the fact that you had successfully killed an African-American, somebody other than their race. So yes, we were able to determine that we were were barking up the right tree here. Wow. So when he does lift up his sleeve and show you that he does have that tattoo. I guess this is a point where you're saying, oh my God, oh my God, you know, (laughs) look at this. He does have this tattoo. As as I said in the beginning, Jerry, there were so many investigations I've been involved in where, yes, you, you receive elation that you've been able to fully investigate and typically coming up with enough enough evidence that a prosecutor is able to say, I can take this case to a jury. And so you make an arrest, and then it goes through the court process. There is a a jury verdict or a guilty plea that gives any investigator detective that that elation that, yes, another job done well, because we all do this for the victims. And in this case, there is still an unknown victim. But Terry and I, at that moment, that CP denied the story had taken place but then begrudgingly showed us his web tattoo. We knew we had a conflict there, a person in conflict, where a person, while denying a simple story that took place, that he could have easily said, yes, I told that story, and how stupid do I feel now as an adult, putting aside those selfish behaviors, where that individual could have said, nobody took me seriously, did they? Is that what is bringing two agents from the ATF and FBI to my doorstep years and years later as a result of a stupid story that my friend and I had told. But we knew when he denied that story that had been told so similarly by individuals that had not talked to each other for 17 years and then begrudgingly showed us the tattoo that was on his elbow. We now knew we had an individual in conflict with his emotions, with his past, etc., Because I can tell you, after talking with CP, after seeing him in his new position in life with the fiance, with dogs, moved away, I felt this was an individual who had moved on, who had changed his ways, who had become an adult with whatever regrets of the past, was able to mature and move on. 
but then we, we laid it on him. CP, we're not going away. We decided not to push too hard because we were out of our element being up in New England away from our home offices in Baltimore and Delaware, where we had felt, let's not push him over the edge. Let's not push him to a point where he has not asked for any attorney at this point. So let's just leave him with that thought that we had just come on to his doorstep late night before, that he had obliged us with an interview. And now we had laid on him the story that we had been following for years and trying to figure out where it's going to take us from there. So we simply left him with the notion that, CP, this is not going anywhere. This is not going to disappear. You have not seen the end of us. And we just want you to know that we are still here for you. And we have confidence that you will do the right thing. CP didn't deny it. He just simply nodded, shook our hands, very respectful, and we parted ways. Now, that was a long ride back, Jerry. (laughs) Terry and I were going through every imaginable angle, questioning of whether we should have gone harder with him, whether we should have played it differently, whether we should have stayed there longer. But the agreement was made, and it was mutual that Terry and I said, enough's enough. Let's leave him with those thoughts. So we made our way back to Delaware, reconvened, spoke with our federal prosecutor and stated what had taken place. And he agreed that he couldn't even come off the fact that it was just a story. No, it was a total denial. But we did verify that the spiderweb tattoo existed. And that's not a small verification, because if you've also established that that spiderweb tattoo means that you have done harm to another person of another race. I mean, that that's an important piece of evidence. Yes. In our, in our minds, it was that uh, there's still some work to be done, that we weren't ready to close the case and move on. Trust me, Terry and I have been now in this investigation for several years with just getting little bits of a glimpse of, of hope that, this, that there's something to the story. Um, that our time invested is not time wasted. And if there is indeed a victim out there that Terry and I believed that it was our job to find and identify this victim, that we believe justice was calling out and Terry and I were, were not partnered by mistake. So we agreed we're going to, we're going to stick with this and we're going to go to our bosses and say, we need more time. And so we were given more time. We developed a good relationship with the Delaware U.S. Attorney's Office at that time. They said, what do you guys need? And we said, we have to figure out how we can get CP in front of a grand jury. We just have to see, is it possible? Do we have enough there to see if a grand jury can go forward? And can we use the subpoena power to get CP to, in fact, testify? That was an obstacle. How do we get him down into Delaware, et cetera? So we started to do our own research, realized that he still had family in Delaware. Once in a while, between Terry and I, we even would exchange a phone call, a very pleasant phone call with CP because we had both exchanged cell phone numbers. CP, have you changed your mind? Is there anything you wish to get off your chest? We are still moving forward on this investigation. We have other witnesses to talk to, but our door is not closed. Developing in the interview interrogation school way, developing that rapport, that long distance relationship, so to speak, because that's what it was becoming a long distance relationship. From the night that we spoke to him, Jerry, to the time that we actually stepped up our game was over a year. Nothing was happening in this case other than us trying to figure out what's going on. I do wonder what is happening though in his mind, a whole year of him knowing that you're out there, that you haven't gone away, that you keep touching base. I can only imagine that he had a whole year of many, many, many sleepless nights. Yes, we were there to take that story to the next step. It was over a year of patience in trying not to to cross that, that boundary where he would shut us down and would make it very difficult. I can tell you, Jerry, we can't force anybody to talk. We did not have any physical evidence to take us anywhere different. We have to figure out how we can get him to do the right thing. And doing the right thing in our heads were, 
him telling us not only that the story was true or that the story had taken place, but what, if any, evidence exists to corroborate and verify something had taken place. All right. So we know that during this time period, since the alleged incident happened, that Tom Guyveson has not led the the most upstanding life because you mentioned that he had been in jail, that he was in jail. Yeah, so he was in jail. He had now since gotten out of jail and uh, living his life working employed in, in Delaware, and we had made no approach to him. How long had he been in jail and what had he been charged with? And at the same time, had CP done any jail time? So from what I remember, Jerry, that Tom had done approximately 10 years as a result of a gun case. And I don't remember the the details of a gun case, but it was an ATF-led gun case. It was a federal time that he was doing. And that CP was also involved in that same case, had served a little bit of time, and I don't know how much time, but definitely not anywhere near the time that um, that Guybison had served, and that ultimately I think CP had been charged with aligning to authorities or something that snared him into the case, cooperated, and and thereby really uh, received a much lighter sentence. CP had had served his time, had had come out and moved away, and Guybison, by the time the investigation into this alleged story of that an African American male had been murdered, Guybison had now completed his term. So we knew as we're moving forward that Guybison now is out and about. So that's where we're at. We're discussing with the prosecutor our next steps, what we're able to do, and are there about a year going back and forth with an occasional phone call to and from CP did not seem to be advancing the ball. CP didn't just all of a sudden come out and said, I'm going to meet you guys get this whole thing over and done with. No, it was a cat and mouse game going back and forth. We realized that in talking with CP that he was coming home into Delaware for something, and I don't recall what what he was traveling back, but he was traveling back to Delaware. And we said, while you are here, would you please come stop in our office? We just want to have a, a, a few minutes chat. Am I under arrest? Absolutely not, CP. You're not under arrest. We've learned or gained nothing more than when we first talked to you, but it is paramount that you stop in and see us. In my amazement, he agreed. And it was rather late in the afternoon, if I remember, it was shortly after 5 p.m. Terry and I had convened again to figure out our next steps. We shouted out to the prosecutor and said, hey, we have a chance here where we're going to talk to CP in our office. What are your thoughts on giving him a grand jury subpoena? So we go back and forth, and the prosecutor said, well, keep me posted. So CP arrives in the Delaware FBI office. Terry and I are there, and we sit down with him. So this is the moment of truth, Jerry. This is where if you could put a poker face on, you must have a poker face. And Terry and I laid it out for him and said, you know, we told you a year ago when we stopped at your residence that this was not going away. And we told you that we would continue to talk to people and figure out the next steps of the case. And coming up towards the next steps of the case would be a grand jury. And we flat out told them, we believe you are lying to us. We believe that you couldn't even tell us the truth, that you told people at your table that you had killed somebody, killed an African-American male, which inspired the spiderweb tattoo. And even if it was just a story, you could not even admit the story. And so we believe you're lying. And this is where it brings us to the next step. So CP took a big sigh, deep breath, put his head down, which to Terry and I was a sign that he was ready to tell all. I'm holding my breath just as much as Terry is holding his breath, wondering, do we say anything or do we just let silence be the motivator here? And then he looked back up at us and he said, do you have a prosecutor available? Now, to me, I don't know, Jerry, that, that is a great sign. And we said, as a matter of fact, we do. But you got to tell us, what is it that you want a prosecutor here for? Now, think about it. 
not that I want my attorney, but that I want your prosecutor. I know. I'm, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait to hear more. So we said, you got you to give us a bone here. What, what are you going to tell us? And he said, I'm going to tell you everything. And I remember between Terry and I saying to CP, CP, at least tell us, is this, are you going to tell us that the story is just a story and that you have evidence to tell us it's just a story and then put an end to all this? Or are you going to tell us that the story is true and you're going to reveal all? And he said, the story is true, but I need to have some assurances and assurances that no investigator can ever give. So we said, stop right there. We will get the prosecutor. I ran out as so, fast as I could, Jerry. <laughs> so he was astute enough to know that it's the prosecutor's office who provides a proffer or immunity or any of those guarantees. Yes, and that's his experience. Remember, in his previous case with uh, Gibson, as he realized he got caught up in a problem, the first person in gets the best deal. And so he realized, okay, I'm not going to call your guy's bluff. I believe you're proceeding with the case in the subsequent grand jury. And I've been down that road before. I'm not about to lie or be caught in a lie. And so thereby, I'm going to tell the truth. He knew that the prosecutor is the only one can offer those assurances, if any. At least the pros coming from the prosecutor, the prosecutor could say, there are no assurances and you must tell all. So I ran out of that office as soon as I could, knowing it's after five o'clock, knowing sometimes on fed time, Sometimes things end at five o'clock and I called the prosecutor and I said, I don't know where you're at, if you're on duty, off duty, home, but this is what's come to light and we need you immediately. And the prosecutor did not bat an eye, did not ask a question and said, I'll be in your office as soon as I can get there. So I went back in, wanted to keep a, a, a straight face, my poker face. And I said, CP, you're on the right track. Just give us a few minutes. The prosecutor is on his way in. The prosecutor arrived. We told him our thoughts and that CP was going to provide us what we believe at that point a confession, but that he was looking for something that only a prosecutor could offer. And it was at that time that CP said, what I am asking for is immunity. That's as much as anyone could ever ask for. Not some consideration, not a lighter sentence, not probation, not whatever else that maybe a prosecutor can dangle in front of an individual, but but immunity. It was at that time that the federal prosecutor explained to CP, I am a federal prosecutor and I can only immunize you as a witness if in fact you are not the trigger puller. I can only immunize you from any federal statutes. I couldn't even begin to immunize you for any local investigation that can arise out of this, especially if you're going to confess to a murder. And CP was very aware of that and said, whatever immunity you can give me in a federal prosecution, and that's all you're able to offer me, that's good enough for me. The federal prosecutor hand wrote a limited immunity agreement letter. And it was at that time that CP then revealed the story as told to us time and time again by everybody at the table. And the story went like this. Gibson and him had been discussing up to the time of the murder in 1989 that they needed to rise to the next level within the skinheads group. And that next level was you must, and I don't remember if it was to assault or murder, but definitely to cause harm to an African American. And so they got a gun and drove around in CP's mother's car. This was important to not only know now that we realize there's a weapon involved, not a knife, not a strong arm robbery, not a beating, but that a weapon, a gun was involved. He described the gun in detail, which is important because if we were able to find a victim and a victim of a homicide and in fact, an autopsy would have been done. It would have described the caliber. So, for example, if CP said, uh, we shot him with a nine millimeter weapon or some other caliber weapon, and the autopsy of a victim showed a different type of, of caliber weapon, that would obviously 
not be good for for the um, for the investigation because you couldn't even corroborate what type of weapon was used. So it was important that we got into the details, the caliber of the weapon, the make and model of the weapon, the car. These were all things that we now realize, could we, if possible, corroborate the story through physical evidence, right? Physical evidence is paramount. So Terry and I are intently writing, gathering as much as we can. CP describes it's an evening, and he is not familiar of the date. He knows it was prior to May of 1989, but he does not remember if it was cold or warm. So this is important because are we at the winter months, the spring months? Where are we at? Are we days ahead? He did not think it was too far in advance of the prom. So that's what we had. And and so he said it was an evening. He thought it was uh, cooler, warmer, not necessarily a hot night, which could put us in the winter to early spring months of 1989. The fact that they rode around in his mother's car, CP's car, looking for an individual, an African-American individual in the streets of Wilmington. CP described that there were too many people out, that they would not be able to shoot somebody and be able to disappear in the cover of darkness. And so they decided to leave Delaware and head into Philadelphia. Described the route as best as he could. Now, remember, we're talking at this point some 16, 17 years later, 1989. And now we are, I believe, in 06 of coming into the story. So they started off in one part of Philadelphia. I believe he said South Philadelphia. Wasn't seeing anyone in particular that they felt that they could shoot and then disappear into the night and get away with it. So they've changed their direction, gone to North Philadelphia. CP describing as best as possible the exits he took, the directions he took. He did not recall streets, but he did recall landmarks. And so he said, describe as best as possible landmarks. And he described a glass pyramid looking structure. And he described a very tall barrier, like a fence or a gate. So these were just things that we were jotting down to say when, in fact, we head in those directions. Could we find? landmarks that depicted what his memory is telling him. He remembers changing license plate to remove a Delaware license plate. They had both stolen a Pennsylvania license plate somewhere in the streets of Philadelphia and uh, put that license plate on. Again, another tool for us to go back and research is there a report of a stolen license plate in that area. Uh, CP was driving. Guyveson was the front passenger seat. And as they are roaming through the streets, they see an individual, what he described, coming down from a stairway porch. And as he approached uh, Guybeson and CP's car, in between cars, CP described as if he was living in the moment, the fact that Guybeson reached out through the open window, fired one shot from the weapon, striking this individual that he described as an African-American male, he said the individual was shot in the head, shot in between the eyes, and that he had hit the ground so hard that he believed, at least CP believed in his mind, that that individual was dead. And hearing him describe and the emotions, the raw emotions of everything coming to light, of him describing this story that had been told in so many different ways that night of the prom. And that was that. Years Terry and I had spent on chasing this story had now come to a moment of truth. And then CP himself unbearing this this secret, this heavy secret for so many years. And to finally come clean was just an amazing moment in our Philadelphia office. But now the story had been told. Again, what's a story? Just another cooperator telling a story that we had heard so many different times, but now in detail, painstaking detail. So 
as you can imagine, having all that information and, and now trying to figure out how do we put the pieces together. So the first call, Sherry, is going to be to Philadelphia Homicide. Who better to go to but my partners, my friends at the Philadelphia FBI Violent Crime Squad. Back then, the old Squad 10. I remember Called up well. a couple of friends of mine and said, hey, this is a story we have trying to see if, in fact, we can find an individual of an unsolved homicide. The Violent Crime Squad put me in touch with a Philadelphia detective uh, in the homicide unit who had also been a sworn federal officer, task force officer, working for the FBI in Philadelphia. And his name was Detective Leon Lubashevsky, very well known as Luby. I called out to Luby, and sure enough, he said, Scott, whatever you guys need, we'll try to help you. And uh, tell me the story. Give me everything you possibly can that can help me, and so be it. So I didn't know anything about how a detective in Philadelphia goes to look through cold cases. When I told him, hey, I, it could be anywhere from 1988 to 1989, I don't want to cut ourselves short or, or miss something by saying, hey, look at anything leading up to only a couple of days of the, the prom. Let's widen the net. Luby said, well, Scott, you're going to have to tie it down to a particular part of the city. Because, you know, we have districts, we have areas, and uh, I can go back and look through, through databases depending on areas. So North Philadelphia wasn't good enough. South Philadelphia wasn't good enough. I needed to zero it down. I need to narrow it down to blocks if I could, right? We didn't have those because uh, CP knew enough to give us areas but wasn't sure exactly of a particular uh, definitely not an address, much less a street or any combination of an area in Philadelphia. Just North Philadelphia was a little too wide of a net. So uh, Luby did his work and um, said, okay, here's the bad news. The bad news is, is 1989 and 1990 are <laughs> some of the worst years in history for the Philadelphia homicide rate. Looking at 1989, there were 489 homicides wow. in Philadelphia. 1990, 505 homicides. So I told him I definitely don't need to go 1990 because we're May of 1989. We believe that the act had already taken place because they had gotten their tattoos. I guess, you know, you can assume that because they're going to be looking at unsolved homicides that you have a good chance. But then again, I'm thinking about in Philadelphia, the number of cases where people have been arrested and accused of a homicide. And then later, years later, we find out that the person was innocent. It's, it's happened so many times here in Philadelphia. So I guess you have to have some type of confidence that, you know, this case continued to be one of the ones listed as unsolved. That's absolutely right, Jerry. So not only are we dealing with the unsolved homicides, but like you said, how many cases of individuals who have been prosecuted and who have maintained their innocence. And so then you have a whole nother caseload of possible cases that could have possibly fit the way that this individual was said to have been shot and killed. And then you're talking, Jerry, not only of the homicides, but just because CP had said that Gibson extended his arm and shot once in the head and the individual fell to the ground um, as if he was dead before he hit the ground. That's not to say that they got out and determined that this individual had, in fact, been the victim of a homicide. And, and so then you have your countless victims of assaults, unsolved or, or not, that, that possibly had to be checked. So this, this by no means was close to a prosecution even being initiated. So Luby continued. Luby said, whatever you guys need, uh, we'll, we'll get you, we'll get your reports and you let us know if there's in fact anything that, uh, starts to look like we have an identified victim and and we can move forward 
from a federal investigation to a homicide investigation. So going back and forth, back and forth, trying to get Luby what he needed. And as he's educating Terry and myself on, on how their reports go back and how they're able to determine what in fact is something that they can look back at a case and say that the facts that were presented to him kind of fit the facts of one of these unsolved cases or a case that, that, uh, presumably was, was solved, but, um, might have an individual attached to it that, that should not be in jail. So you're dealing with a lot of different juggles here. I told you from the beginning, Jerry, that Terry and I believe that we were part of this case for reasons beyond what we can comprehend and, and that a victim was calling out to us regardless. And we absolutely believed with our collective fates that we weren't going to stop and that justice was going to be sought for this individual that we believed was shot on the streets of Philadelphia for nothing more than the color of his skin. So this, this was a great motivator for, for Terry and I not to stop, not to be overwhelmed by, by the fact that 1989, there's 489 homicides, that there's approximately upwards of 36 unsolved homicides. And then not to mention, like you had said earlier, what about the other cases that have been prosecuted, but have somebody in jail that should not be sitting in jail? So this had crossed our mind, had, had weighed on our, on our hearts, but we went forward. We, uh, we put CP in a car. We drove as much as we could figuring out where, what possible exits he got off, where they possibly could have stolen the license plate, where they finally wound up and where they had shot this individual. So we kept at it going through Philadelphia records saying this fits or that's fit. And like I told you before, it's important to know that CP had given us the proper caliber. If he was shot in the head and the bullet remained with the victim, as opposed to not being found by evidence collection teams, there was one paper that Terry and I remember reading, very short and sweet written report that an individual by the name of Aaron Wood shot in between two cars where he was struck in the face as described by CP because he had witnessed it himself. The caliber presumed at that point by ballistics and the autopsy reports was a 38 caliber as described by CP. This individual was somebody that we were going to look closer. It was the night of April 16th, 1989, just a few weeks before prom night celebrated by Gibson and CP at the Hotel DuPont, shot in the streets of Philadelphia and succumbed to his injuries and one of the unsolved homicides. It was at least we've identified a victim that the Philadelphia Homicide Unit could now take a closer look and see if there's enough to pursue an investigation. At that moment, Terry and I, along with CP, were able to turn the case over to Luby and the Philadelphia Homicide Unit, and they were able to take that case and whatever else they were able to get out of CP and present it to a grand jury and ultimately charge Guy Bison with homicide. It was an amazing point in our lives where we felt this victim had been reaching out to us through the grave. It was so many raw emotions that Terry and I were able to experience and say we, we were called to this moment. We were not just going to allow this to remain in a file. The case was presented. Terry and myself, along with Philadelphia Homicide and a host of others, including SWAT teams from the Delaware State Police, arrested Guy Bison on the early morning of 2007. He was turned over to Philadelphia Homicide to face charges of murder and other related charges. Philadelphia, on their own, had spoken to CP, as well as some other witnesses that they were able to put on the stand and were able to put a case together, not only to charge him, but to present it before a jury in Philadelphia. And I remember meeting the brother of Aaron Wood and seeing a family member, speaking with a family member who had said for so many years, 
so many years had haunted him that his own brother's name had been dragged through the papers of being a, a victim of a homicide, either as a result of this story or that story. And they weren't all good stories. The family had to suffer through that. And so they were very grateful that what we were able to put together. And so ultimately, it all lies in the hands of a jury. And what did a jury do? A jury, after listening, had those same questions that I have and you had, Jerry, and anyone else listening to this, acquitted him of any murder charges. Guy Besson was not found guilty of the murder of Aaron Wood. So after all of that, you get an acquittal? A partial acquittal. And I think that's why we're, we're here today. The acquittal was for murder, but the related charges, the jury found CP and others such compelling witnesses that they absolutely believed them. They absolutely believed CP that he was the driver and he was the witness, even though he actively participated by driving Guy Besson there even though he didn't pull the trigger, and that was essential in our early and first immunity offering, that he in fact witnessed an individual being murdered. And that between the Philadelphia homicide and our investigation, that even though we believe that the only homicide that could fit those circumstances of somebody being shot in the head and of the particular caliber weapon and near, even though we couldn't give an exact location, we're able to, between the, the different landmarks, for example, like I, I talked earlier of these glass pyramids that seem to stick out in CP's head, driving 15, 16, 17 years later, are you going to see these, these landmarks? Is it possible that they're no longer there? What is it that, that CP is recalling of seeing things in Philadelphia? And we had seen different septa type structures, different glass pointy pyramid-like structures in and around Philadelphia off of Broad Street, where we said, look, look at that CP. You see, it's a glass pyramid and it looked like it's a septa station. Is it possible that that's what you were seeing? Sure, it's possible. What he described as a very tall gate, fence, concrete structure, this is what he's able to see. Think of a, of a 17, 18 year old embarking on this horrific travel with the intent to harm somebody, a racially motivated crime, to actually witness your friend, your associate shooting a gun and striking what you intended to strike, an African American male, and then to whisk out of there in such a hurry. What is it that your eyes are catching, your ears are catching, and that are forever seared in your brain? This is what we had to go with as opposed to somebody who grew up in the streets of Philadelphia. It wasn't. They were Delaware born and raised. And so we believed the tall structure to be the Girard College, the concrete fence, so to speak. Thereby, the jury had everything other than actual physical evidence to put them. No surveillance cameras, no DNA, just working off the memory of an individual some 17 years later. And they absolutely believed him and thereby came up with the judgment of finding Guy Besson guilty of gun-related charges as well as a hate crime. They believed that there was a conspiracy, that there was a desire to go and leave Delaware, enter Philadelphia, find somebody that they believed, in fact, Guy Besson shot. But they weren't willing, as I believe they, they weighed the evidence carefully, with all the other doubts that we have in our heads as to other unsolved homicides or homicides that have been committed that could possibly have somebody else sitting in jail who is not guilty for it. And so all these things, I think, weighed on the jury that they could not, in fact, find him guilty of the murder of Aaron Wood, but that he was guilty of planning the murder of an African-American male. And they believe, CP, that the two, in fact, came into Philadelphia sought out an African-American male and shot him. And so thereby, it was those related charges that they found Guy Besson, and uh, he was subsequently sentenced up to 13 to 25 years in uh, state prison. And he served those years. They have been upheld on appeal to a point, and then other appeals have knocked down the number of years. The convictions were upheld, but ultimately his sentence was reduced and he served those years in prison. So were the results 
satisfying to you? I believe in my history as an investigator, I can only gather the evidence that's there. Terry and I have spent many years battling whether the story was ever true, but we always believe there's something driving us to not let the story go down. Because I can tell you how many times somebody would call in with a very vague set of facts of an alleged crime. And you report those and you write it down and, and it for, will forever remain in a file simply because there's not enough to put time or resources. And so this story could have forever remained at the table of that senior prom. But there was something driving Terry and I to get to the bottom of it. And we were able to win over CP. And I absolutely believe his story. Even though he couldn't identify the victim, much less anyone else, I do believe justice was served here. That a racially motivated homicide was taken to its absolute end depths. Nothing was left unturned. I'm looking at a, a newspaper article, and I just want to acknowledge that the victim, even though you know we can't be 100% sure, but the victim, again, was identified as 34-year-old handyman Aaron Wood. Yes. I guess one of the last questions that I have related to CP is at any time during this discussion, I mean, his actions, of course, you know, give us some indication of his mindset. But did he at any time actually say to you that he was remorseful? And if his views concerning that hatred that would have an unknown innocent victim killed, did he indicate that those views had changed? Yes. He is, in fact, an, an unindicted co-conspirator, cooperator. But this case could have gone nowhere without the testimony of CP. Ha having interviewed many people during my years, and you kind of get a gist of who's telling you the truth, who's minimizing, who's lying, who has a good heart. I believe CP genuinely had renounced everything that he had ever thought of with regards to his participation and actions within uh, the skinhead movement, whether informal or formal, I could, without a doubt, say that he was so regretful and remorseful of having those thoughts in his late teen years, much less the actions that, that he says he engaged in. Now, why the spider web tattoo remained, I couldn't tell you whether he sought to remove it or not. I can tell you he was deeply embarrassed not only to show us that tattoo, but to be in possession of that tattoo and for what it represents. No doubt in my mind. I think he had such fear from those days that when we came up to him in Vermont and those floodlights went on, that those floodlights were very representative of the fear and the regret he had of his past. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Scott Duffy, lots of articles about this case, and a mugshot of Thomas Gibbonson and the tattoo that he has on his head. I tried my best, but I couldn't find a photo of the spiderweb tattoo. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, as well as other podcast apps and YouTube. This podcast is where I talk about FBI true crime. But if you're interested in crime fiction, then you want to join my reader team, where once a month I send out an email where I review FBI crime dramas, books, TV, and movies, and tell you what they get right and what they get wrong. When you join my reader team, I'll send you a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have appeared on this podcast. Nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You can join my reader team at jerrywilliams.com, or if you're listening to this episode on a podcast app, there's a link in the description of this episode. Make sure to pick up your copy of FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, and the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, 
All of my books are available wherever books are sold. I want to thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.